Hello. Okay, so thanks for joining us this morning, everyone. We're really happy to be joined by Karen McGuinness from the Autism Hub. Um, so she's going to be talking through shortly um, about how to access their service and a bit about them and what it is that they do. Um, so first of all, same as usual, just a bit of housekeeping. The session is being recorded um, and that will be uploaded to the website once Stream has, has edited that together. As, as usual, names and um, faces will be removed, so don't worry about that, but it will be there if you want to catch up uh, later on. Uh, let's have a look. If you would like to ask a question, what we're going to do, we'll take a break roughly halfway through. And if you'd like to ask a question, you can either pop that in the chat box or raise your hand. And what we'll do is when we come back after the break, we'll spend a few minutes going through any questions from the first half. And then once the second half is finished, we'll cover any questions that have come up during that second half, if that makes sense. And um, so, yeah, raise a hand or pop them in the, the chat box and we'll ask those questions to Karen when we get to that point. Just to clarify, with the raising hand, if you could um, actually use the button on your accounts, so then basically you you get bumped up to the top then and we can see if you've got a question. If you just do that, we won't be able to see you, unfortunately, because there's so many of you. Um, so, yeah, as Evie said, if, it, if you could just pop a message in or use the hand function, um, then we'll be able to see you and answer your questions. Okay, well, I think that's everything, Karen. If you're happy, we'll... Um, if you want yes. to share your yeah. screen and we'll, we'll get started. Yeah, more than happy. Well, thank you so much um, for having me today. Um, just a quick, I was going to do housekeeping, but you've just done that wonderfully. So just a quick little introduction um, on myself. So I am the strategic manager of the West Cheshire Autism Hub. Um, I have a personal um, interest in autism as well, inspired by my family. So um, I have three children, two of which are diagnosed autistic. Um, one I believe also to be so. Um, my husband was diagnosed in his 40s by um, Dr. Linda Buchanan. Um, and my journey um, with autism um, began. We were trying to access services and support and we were finding it very hard um, to access um, the support that we needed. Um, not via um, Linda, I have to say, to other areas. Um, and in the end, it became easier to actually study myself. So um, my degree and my master's is in autism with the, the Autism Centre for Education and Research at Birmingham University. Um, recent developments in my life are actually also fostering another autistic um, young adult. Um, so out of the 14 in my house, three are diagnosed autistic. And we have a lot of experience with lots of other coexisting conditions, mental health, um, gender dysphoria, um, so on. Um, so I'm very passionate about providing support to autistic adults and um, autistic children as well, but also their family members. Um, and that's how I ended up um, doing the job that I'm doing at the West Cheshire Hub. Um, so for those of you who haven't been to our service, I'm hoping today will answer some of your questions. If you have any questions at all after today, please don't um, hesitate to contact myself or I'm sure um, Axie ASD would do so on, on your behalf. Um, we're more than happy to put you at ease um, and to make it easier to come and enter. Um, I think Linda's trying to come back in. Um, so we've had members that have felt very anxious about entering um, the building, for example, um, and we are more than happy to go over and above to support that and, you know, be concrete and explicit about what to expect when you come to visit us. Um, this is the bit where I do tech and I'm not really great at tech. My studies are in autism, not tech. So just bear with me. Um, okay, I've gone straight to it. Let me know when you can see it. I will go to slideshow. Can you see it yet? Okay. Just shut my window down, otherwise you can't see the whole screen. Okay, so the West Cheshire Autism Hub seems to be spending a lot of my time there. I'm feeling like it's a beautiful building um, in the heart of Chester, um, so it's very much in the community. 
Um, and I have been involved right from the beginning in a voluntary capacity as a carer of autistic um, young adults and obviously um, married to an autistic adult. And right from the beginning, um, I stressed that we wanted autistic adults and their family to be at the heart of everything we do. Um, at numerous meetings, I did keep saying we need to bring it back to autistic adults um, and their family members and really make meaningful differences in their lives and quality of life. Um, so for those of you who, who don't know, we are based at the Blue Coat Building in Chester City Centre and our interest, entrance is on Canal Street. It can be a little bit confusing for those of you who, who know the Blue Coat Building. There are a number of different charities and offices there. And the front of the building, there's an archway and there's lots of different buzzers. And that can be a bit confusing um, for some of our members. I want to stand out there with a big foam arrow or something, you know, pointing this way. Um, so the entrance is on the side on Canal Street. I'm more than happy to send you a picture of that entrance um, ahead of you um, visiting, or I could send it over to Axia so that they could share that information with you. So we are open most days, Monday to Friday. Um, we're not quite open as much as I would like yet. Um, there is only myself on 22 hours. Um, I have a lovely admin assistant um, who, is herself part time. Recording stopped. And um, your recording has stopped. Did that come up for you too? Yeah, just to let you know. Yeah, it seems to be fine on my computer, Karen. I'm not sure what that was, but we'll go with it. <laughs> it's fine, don't worry. Um, <laughs> it's always a tech glitch somewhere when I'm involved. <laughs> See, it's me. It's me. It's bound to be me. Um, so we have an admin assistant on part-time hours and we have um, a wonderful support assistant. Again, she's only on 10 hours. So because we're all part-time, um, we're not open yet Monday to Friday and um, every hour just walking off the street, which is what I want. I want people to just be able to drop in. Um, so a lot of our activities are bookable. We do have a couple of drop-in sessions and weekly. Um, but as we um, get more funds, um, which I'm constantly seeking, we can start to open more and open in the evenings and weekends too. Um, and then increase the amount of support that, that you all um, require and, and deserve. Um, so we do very much um, hope to increase that time. Um, we do have this small number of dedicated staff, like I say. Um, please be patient with us. Um, if, if we don't always get back to you um, within the 24 hour fright, um, time frame that we, we like to um, for autistic adults, um, we will be very much um, trying to contact you as soon as possible. So this is a little bit of a confusing slide, but I just wanted to talk you through it. Um, so there's, like I say, different things on different days. So Monday, we're not open. Um, on Tuesdays, um, you can book one-to-one -one support appointments with Donna. We try to make it as clear as possible, um, but I appreciate it. It can still be confusing. Wednesday is for Vivo Care only, so that is not something that you would be accessing. On Thursdays, you can access one-to-one -one appointments with myself. Um, and Fridays, you can access one-to-one -one appointments with either myself or Donna. Um, we have a number of activities running through the week as well, um, which I'll explain later. And they tend to be bookable by, via either Eventbrite or Bookrun. Um, and we share those links on our website. But the main take home that I want you to sort of know from this is there are three days a week where you can book one-to-one -one support sessions with myself or with Donna. Um, if Donna is not able to answer your questions in those support sessions, um, she will um, feed back to me and I will very much advise in order some specific strategies um, and support. Um, and we will always follow up with resources and um, an email so that you can, you know, to help process the information that we've discussed with you. So what we do, get asked this question an awful lot. 
and have to say it's mostly by professionals, even though we've, we've sent a lot of information out. So we have to keep repeating and telling people. Um, the most important thing is that you know what we do. Um, and I think if I was going to sum it up, it would be what you need. So if we don't um, currently do something that you need, please feed that back to us. And as our service grows and develops, we will incorporate that um, so that you're getting the service and that you want. Um, the, the hub is very much, we want it to be led by yourselves. So it is a welcoming space for everyone. We, we, would, we want it to be an inclusive environment. Um, the intention was, it, was, was for it to be a non-clinical space. We're trying to move away from, um, just let Ellie in. Um, we're trying to move away from that clinical um, sort of medicalized feel um, that often people experience whilst going through the diagnostic process. Um, and we want you to feel that you can have a safe space where you can learn about your diagnosis in a non-clinical environment. Um, so you're not initially, you know, walking in with that deficit feel and feeling like you're at fault. We want we want to explain to you and you to feel that actually many of the difficulties in the community that you've experienced are not because of you. It's because people aren't making the adjustments that they should. Um, and we are seeing numerous adults that really um, come to see us and use words like, I feel like a deficient neurotypical, which is just not what we want at all. We don't want you to feel like that with us. We want you to feel valued for who you are. Um, so very much at all times, we keep autistic adults and their families at the heart of everything we do. And I wrote that into the core values and objectives right at the start. We explore innovative ways of working in partnership. Um, and I know that sounds a bit trite when you read something like that. But all I can say is that uh, on a personal level, as a carer of autistic children, the best services that I've ever had or my children have ever had are those that are willing to be flexible and to find a way to solve a solution. So very solution focused. In my experience, it is not autistic people that are rigid at all. It is neurotypicals who are determined to do things exactly the same way and won't budge so our service very much try and find a different way of doing things and quite often if somebody tells me no I say well is there another way we can look at it um this person needs this support this service can we come at it from a different um place so we will work with lots of different services and agencies um to try and get your support needs met and like I say, we're working flexible and flexibly and wherever possibly we want to try and take proactive measures to avoid crisis um, before it actually happens. And like I say, we don't just meet the needs of autistic adults. We meet the needs of their families as well um, so that it's a person centred, holistic support going the wrong way. See, I told you glitches so our focus is to provide personalized support to autistic adults age 16 and above as well as their families in the heart of the community if however you have a loved one that is 15 and a half i am not going to turn you away and this is what i mean about flexibility so what, what we will do is we will just keep in touch or support you remotely via email um, and then we will so it's a seamless transition into services as opposed to this cliff edge that many people experience so our service is in response to gaps in support for autistic adults particularly if individuals don't meet the threshold for other services so we have a very wide open door policy um if somebody needs support they get it um, and that is basically it. Um, the number one question I am asked is how do we refer to your service? And I, I frequently say that we don't we don't have referrals. If if um, a service or an agency want us feel that our support is needed, that's fine. If an individual feels their support is needed, that's fine. Um, so it's not, there's no jumping through hoops or difficulty to access our service. Um, and I think as many of you will know, sadly, um, very often the needs of autistic adults, particularly without a learning disability, their needs are missed. 
Um, and we don't turn individuals away with a learning disability. We're inclusive and we um, we provide support for everybody um, that's age 16 plus and that's autistic with coexisting conditions or not. But the difference with our service is, is that we recognise that individuals without a learning disability that may well be able to communicate verbally, that often their needs are missed. So their verbal ability can mask their level of difficulty that they're experiencing. And we recognize that, whereas I think too many services do not. Um, so we do not make assumptions that um, just because you are able to communicate, if you are able to communicate verbally, we do not make assumptions that therefore that means that you don't have difficulties every day, you know, perhaps with executive functioning, sensory overload. Um, we try not to make assumptions, you know, full stop. Um, so our environment, the project provides is a social environment where people can access the service while feeling valued and welcome. To start with, it was very quiet. My challenge at the moment is to maintain that lovely sensory calm atmosphere whilst the popularity of our service is increasing. And this is where if you do try and, up and access a drop-in session and you find it too sensory stimulating, this is where the one-to-one -one support sessions can really come in because if you want to mix with other autistic um, adults and, and have that peer mentor support, you can do so. If you would rather have a one-to-one -one conversation um, with myself or Donna, you can also do that. Um, it's very much what your, your needs are and what you would feel would work best for you. As well as the services offered at the Autism Hub, we work proactively, like I say, with local partners, keeping up to date with services across the borough. So constantly um, researching and um, linking in with different um, services so that we know and what they're running um, does help because I'm also in a voluntary capacity, the branch chair of the National Autistic Society. So I'm able to sort of keep in the loop with other charitable organisations as well. And it just helps um, to keep those links. Um, and also we're in the same building as Cheshire West Voluntary Action. So <laughs> it's quite handy. Um, so what this does is it allows us to signpost people to services through the networks of support we have developed. Um, as I've realised, it's when I mean, we start a new job, it's a steep learning curve. Um, and as I've realised is that many um, services, when they try and refer people to us, what they're quite often doing is passing on. So they are stopping their service and they're referring on to us and then they want to step away. So what, what we do <laughs> is say, no, we want to you to carry on working with our autistic adults. Um, we will also work with you to try and meet the gaps in their support. So what we're trying to do um, and our intention is, is to not duplicate or do things that other services should be doing. Um, we are going, you know, to our aim and intention is, is to fill those gaps where, the, where you're not getting support. Um, so. Thought it might be helpful just to give you um, a little bit of a visual, really. Um, and there's this little caveat at the bottom that says, please note that we do not provide services that have been commissioned by other services. And um, really, I suppose that is there more for um, services and agencies. Um, just to say, <laughs> it's not really for you. I do have to say, if services and agencies aren't doing something they should and you are having a massive battle and in the meantime you're not getting what you need then we will do everything we can to help you um, get what you need um, it's just we're seeing quite a lot of people trying to, to do things that they're commissioned for in terms of services and agencies we very much will always try and um, meet your need I have quite a red line I don't know where from but Apologies for that. So, direct support offered by our service. Um, autistic, or, or, autistic, sorry about my um, spelling error there. Specific advice and support, including pre and post diagnostic support. Um, we support people who self identify as autistic. 
and we support people on the pathway um, and also post-diagnostically. So um, through the whole journey, if, if you like. Um, coming in January, um, we will be starting um, a post-diagnostic um, six-week course and that will also be tied, tied in with peer mentor programme. Don't have a actual date yet, um, but you know, please email me if you would like further information. Um, we also encourage self-advocacy and mentoring services so in development at the moment is the peer mentor programme um, and also a number of um, self-advocacy projects. We have a variety of different activities and events which are constantly evolving. Um, so currently at the moment, we've just finished mindfulness. Um, we are also doing craft and um, art um, classes um, and we're doing the virtual reality um, drop-in session um, and cooking as well, I'm trying to remember them all. Um, I very much feel that um, our service is helping to alleviate loneliness and isolation, providing that sense of community, um, a place where you can meet with um, autistic other autistic adults um, and just have a coffee and, you know, <laughs> cake and biscuits. Um, so we just we're starting to get a really sort of lovely group of people that are coming in. Um, I did joke last week that I need a, a sensory friendly bell with like a rubber insert. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if anybody makes them because I'm feeling a little bit like a landlady because nobody wants to leave. And I have to say it's, it's, it's last, I feel like saying it's last orders. Um, but everybody's really enjoying the environment, which is really, really nice to see. Um, so that's that sense of community and very much support and acceptance of difference and nobody needs to be um, the same. So we've got a, a wide cohort of different people and um, some that are um, communicating um, verbally, some that are using um, assisted communication devices um, and we're just, it's accepting everybody for who they are. Um, we have a lot of fiddly toys and sensory things dotted around and if you're in the middle of a one-to-one -one appointment with me and you need to get up and move around the office um, stay and do anything you know I've had people sit in the corner of, of the room whatever you need to do then people can do do whatever they need to to feel comfortable let's close this window now so Commission services, as I've said, where there are a limited number of staff and volunteers at the Autism Hub. So if an individual wishing to access the sessions needs a one-to-one -one key worker, um, this will generally need to be commissioned by an agency with the necessary staffing provided or funded to support the individuals to take part. And if you'd like to discuss this option, then please contact us um, and we'll provide um, our details at the end of the talk. We are able also to offer in-depth training on a variety of different autism-specific topics, and these services are generally also commissioned. Um, again, please contact us for further inquiries. I tend to do things like this. Um, I'm hoping you'll have me back at some point, um, but I do like regularly um, for Aspire as well, um, and just so we can share um, good autism practice and resources, and um, always happy to... Um, respond to suggested topics as well. So um, recently did one on executive functioning, which I found quite helpful for myself too. So, um, so urgent mental health support, um, as many of us know, um, sadly there's a high rate of coexisting mental health conditions in the autistic um, community. Mostly I would say, <laughs> A big factor in that is, is the barriers that you're experiencing in the community. And hopefully services like ours will, will really go a long way. Um, we do occasionally see um, individuals that are requiring urgent mental health support. Um, so whilst we are absolutely happy to provide mental health support and, and do so um, regularly, particularly um, addressing 
um, issues relating to, to being autistic, such as, say, masking or camouflaging, um, autistic burnouts, so, you know, those kind of issues. Um, obviously, if there's an urgent mental health um, crisis, we um, just would like to say that we're not that service. Um, so here's the um, CGWP crisis line. Um, and also we do work closely with number 71, the Spider Project in Chester, um, or the Crisis Cafe, as some of you will, will know it as. Um, and they have a, a, they're open much longer hours than us. <laughs> they've, got, they've got more staff. Um, and we do it very closely with them. Um, and they feedback with us with regards to members and, and vice versa, obviously with your consent. So... I did this little summary here just as a, a, a visual, really. Um, and there's a variety of different emails. There's my email, there's Donna's email, there's Jess's. And I thought it could get a bit confusing. So Jess is going to love me for this. I'm just going to put her as the point of contact and she can she can send it to, to everybody. Um, Jess joined us, very much a success story. Um, she joined us um, as a supported intern through WorkZone and um, she's just absolutely thriving and doing really well with us. Um, she declared the day that she wants to work with us for the rest of her life, which bless her at 19 is, is, a, is a big thing. Um, so she's that point of contact there in the middle and I'll talk you through. So if you fancy to accessing any of these things, if you email jessica.ellums at westchesterautismhub.co.uk, um, she will send it to the relevant um, people and book you, help you book onto things. So we've got the one-to-one -one support sessions in person, via the phone or virtual, and we can be very flexible. If you don't want your screen on, that's absolutely fine. Um, if you um, would like to plan a session beforehand so you know what we're going to discuss, again, that's absolutely fine. And we'll provide a summary um, of our um, appointment to help with processing. And this could be looking at a variety of different issues. Um, and I'm trying to think of the, some that we've had in the last few days. Autistic burnout was a particular interest of mine. Um, managing your um, emotional and social energy supply um, or those of you who don't know if you're familiar with spoons um, my master's dissertation was um, in managing your spoons if you don't know what I'm talking about you're all going to think I'm mad um, but it's to do with managing that energy that social and emotional energy supply um, so we've had um, topics on burnout um, in the last few days, executive functioning, create, creating an emotional toolbox, um, time management, um, processing a diagnosis. So these are just some of the um, issues that our um, appointments have touched on the last few days. Difficulties with accommodation, although you know, we don't, um, we're not a housing service, um, but Obviously, we can um, advise on sensory related issues um, and send emails to people mm -hmm. should they require a little bit of a push in the right direction, should I say. Um, so that's a sort of an example for you. But really, we're not limited to anything that you want to talk about or tackle. We're happy um, to work through. Um, the mindfulness sessions um, run by Gary, an, an autistic gentleman, are absolutely amazing. Our virtual reality drop in on a Thursday. Um, you don't have to do the virtual reality. You can just come and watch other people and laugh, um, which I'm one of those people. I like to watch them. Um, so, you, you know, you, if you, no pressure to join it. Um, peer support, which I think is so important. Um, and it's really important for, for mental health and good mental ha health outcomes in um, the autistic population. That sense of belonging, which, you know, which is related to peer support. Um, craft, we find that many of our members want to talk about um, and share issues and difficulties that they're experiencing, but it can, it can be easier doing so whilst doing an activity. So alongside an activity, it's less, less pressured um, and 
and the craft sessions are amazing. I've got some lovely creations drying in my window currently. Drop in and chat on a Friday, which um, is is very popular, um, and also our cooking, um, which again um, we that we're very lucky that the lady that delivers it um, again is an autistic adult. She's amazing and her plans are so um, organised and, and visual and concrete and explicit. There's nothing confusing at all about it. Um, and she tackles things, you know, um, like batch cooking, um, trying to sort of limit um, pressures on executive functioning and, and looking at meal planning and those, um, those kind of issues. Um, which as a working woman, I have to say, I've, I've picked up quite a lot of tips from her. It's quite handy. Um, so I thought it'd be nice to just show you around um, so you could see what it's like. Um, those of you who know the Blue Coat, it is a great listed building. Um, so it's definitely got lots of atmosphere. Um, I sometimes go in Liverpool um, just without the Beatles. Um, so we've got these lots of these arches here. Um, and it is, it's very, very um, atmospheric and very nice. Um, we didn't quite end up with the budget that I had originally anticipated, um, but I've managed to get make it nice and welcoming, I think, and um, colour coordinated it all with the logo. Um, so we'll just close this down. Um, so what we've tried to do is create different areas um, for people to sit. So if you want to sit in a more... Um, environment where you're really close to other people that's fine if you just want to sit quietly on your own and read a book um or sort of be on the periphery of the conversation that is also absolutely okay so that's room one and this is part of room two um, and we've got a few of these um informal seating areas and then this area here is um the room where we have the one-to-one -one support sessions in my office. And this is part of my office. Um, so um, there is a screen that goes in between here, just so that um, you can just comfortably take your masks off because we're in a, obviously in a smaller room um, and you don't need to worry about wearing a mask. Um, so um, it sort of goes about three quarters of the way across the room and um, quite high. Um, so that we can both take our masks off. And I think you'll agree it's that non-clinical environment that we want. So our hub, um, or I should say your hub, because that's basically what it is, is a social environment where autistic adults and their families can access services whilst feeling valued and welcome. And I wanted to include a couple of these um, quotes because I just think they're so important. Um, Autistic space is so validating compared with the outside world. Um, and I would hope that when you come to the hub, that that is how you will feel, that you will feel validated um, and that you will feed that back to us. And if any reason you don't feel like that, um, then we will do our very best to um, solve any issues that are arising. And this quote, which I just think says it all, I am me and that is okay. And I just, yeah, love it. So our contact details, which I thought would help um, for you to see. Um, if in doubt, email Jess and she will get everything to us anyway. If you want to email me directly, that's my email. And this is lovely Donna, our um, support worker. Our website is regularly uh, updated by the comms team. Um, and you will find news shared on there. Um, our calendar of events is regularly updated. Um, and also we have a selection of resources which are free to download. We've also printed them off for some of our members too. Um, just all you have to do is ask and then we'll have them there for when you pop in. That might be a communication um, profile or passport, our communication cards. Um, we have resources like meeting planners just to help you prepare ahead of important meetings, um, our health passport. Um, so they, they will be um, added to at all times 
And if you feel there's something we should have and we haven't got, let me know and we'll get it sorted as soon as possible. Um, I think we'll have had items into the chat box. Um, and I think the plan um, is for us to have a break shortly um, so we can all have a brew and to the toilet and what have you. Um, and then we can have a look at the pictures, can't we, ladies? Not the pictures, the um, questions. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, so if we all go for a little bit of a break now, about 10 minutes or so, and then we'll come back and go through some comments and then carry on. Is that something? Everybody back? Cool. Okay, I think we're going to have a look through um, some of the questions that came through in the chat. Um, so we had, oh, the, there was a comment here saying, um, yesterday I had a chat with a nice lady who's married to an autistic too. She mentioned that many of her clients, mixed couples, say where there is an autistic in the family, the whole family become a bit autistic. What would you say to them? I would agree with the comments in the chat. It, it's one of my pet hates. I hate that everyone's a little bit autistic comment. Um, and I, I, when I say this to people, um, I get quite a sort of bit of a shocked reaction and they're like, really? Well, why, why, why do you find it offensive? And I'm like, well, I don't really, I, <laughs> I always say that I think it's coming from a good place. I think they're trying to sort of identify with autistic people, but they're just saying something that's, that is unintentionally really, really insensitive. Um, and I think really what they're identifying with is humanity because we're all human. That doesn't mean we're all autistic or all non-autistic. And they're just focusing on that. Oh, um, I do that too. Well, look, of course there will be areas, overlapping areas because we're all human beings. So that <laughs> I, I just don't understand why people say this really. Um, sorry. Yeah, there was a lot of people in the chat who had the same views you there, Karen. Um, yeah. A couple of people asking for, if you know of a similar service in other areas, somebody who asking about Manchester, City or South. Um, I have to do a bit of research on that. I mean, obviously there are a few, there are a few different hubs. So you've got space for autism. Um, I'm not really that familiar with Manchester autism services. I would agree there are there is too much focus on um, children and not enough on autistic adults um, so it's either children or parents of children um, and we need to obviously you know that certainly um, autistic um, children need to be provided for in their family you know when we've I've done a lot of that and, I, and I, st I still do a lot of that voluntarily but we need to we need to sort of remember that autistic children grow up to be autistic adults it's not a surprise that we have autistic adults if we've all got had autistic children but somehow people do seem to be surprised by this which is a bit of a puzzle to me um so services it is a lifelong neurodevelopmental disability services should be lifelong yeah absolutely um somebody else asking i don't know if this is somebody who maybe lives between two areas um or sort of travels between but saying do you have to be living in the chester area all year to access no <laughs> no, I, no, I mean, basically, I'm very lucky. Um, my boss is a very flexible person as well. So if I want to do something, I can do it. And I, I don't really, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in supporting people. I'm not going to turn you away if you don't live in the Chester or Cheshire, Western Chester area, 365 days of the year. Yeah, good. Um, looking through, I think that's the sort of main questions that came through, unless anybody has thought of anything in the break that they want to ask can i just say neurodivergent cleaning crew sounds amazing <laughs> yeah. i can't wait to get <laughs> i need to check this out i think that if this is as good as it sounds i think i'll be yeah. sharing this later <laughs> um perfect okay i don't think we're going to get any other questions at the moment so um do you want to start with the, the second session Karen? yeah um let me Find it. Okay. And we'll do, we'll work this um, second session the same, everyone. So if you want to sort of ask questions throughout, either in the chat box or by using the raise hand function, 
then when we get to the end of Karen's presentation, we can we can ask those questions. I'm laughing because my phone ringing is my husband. <laughs> who's, diag who's diagnosed by Linda and he's, he's we've obviously because we've had that conversation this morning he's not he's not processed that I'm delivering what time I've <laughs> <laughs> at some point he's I'm gonna get oh no I'm sorry <laughs> but it's my fault because I should have I should have sent the information visually I know this <laughs> oh, right so bit of a favorite topic of mine so um, it's intro section. So thank you for letting me talk about this. Um, I do need to say I am not an occupational therapist, um, but obviously I have had to study um, sensory aspects of autism, sensory differences. And this is something um, that's very close to my heart because of um, my oldest son. Um, I ended up sort of looking into this quite, quite a bit. Makes sense of a lot of things. I'm hoping that you will all find it as interesting as me. Um, so, interoception um, is a sense that isn't talked about um, as much as, as, as it should be. It's sort of becoming more popular and you're seeing it more around in, in, on different forums and things now, which is fantastic. It still amazes me how many professionals don't talk about um, proprioception um, or vestibular in terms of sensory, um, and they're certainly um, very often not aware of what interoception is and the important role that it plays in so many different factors um, in individuals' lives. So. The title of this talk is Interoception and the role it plays in self-regulation and emotional overwhelm. So I'm going to start with this slide and you're going to think, as, as Karen um, sort of had a bit of a moment here, has she now forgotten um, what she's talking about, which, you know, an hour into a talk, you know, could be quite likely because um, you have that brain fog moment, but I will, it, it will become clear. So the effort required to navigate through the world. And I think just sometimes it's good to bring it back to actually, you know, what autistic people experience in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and this is something that comes up time and time again. Um, many autistic individuals use their cognition to work out the unwritten social rules that govern interaction. So they're, they are seeming to pull it up, off on the surface, You've got those individuals where it's obvious they're not pulling it off, but then you've got lots of individuals where on the surface they're seeming to, um, but they're doing it all top down. So they're doing it by cognition. It's requiring a lot of effort, a lot of thought. They're going through scripts in the head. They're constantly rehearsing what somebody might say and how they're going to respond. And on the surface, they like I say, they're appearing to, to, to pull it off, but there's a cost. As a massive cost and it's that exhaustion you know we see high levels of autistic burnout um, and these are you know very um, important factors at play here so they're using learned skills instead of coping instinctively there's some skills that neurotypicals have um, that is intuitive that is instinctive they don't even know that they're doing it um, they are required from a very early age. So that you know, might be turn taken in conversation, it might be um, interpreting gestures, facial expressions, um, navigating the numerous unwritten social rules that govern um, interaction. Um, not to mention, you know, that us neurotypicals, uh, we, we don't say what we mean. You know, we say we're just going to nip into a shop for two things and we come out with 40 or 50 things. You know, we are quite confusing as individuals. So there's all of this to navigate all of the time. And it's not something that you find instinctive. It doesn't come naturally to you. You have to work really, really hard at it. So this can lead to an almost constant state of alertness and anxiety, leading to risk of mental and physical exhaustion. Um, and I see, you know, lots of adults sitting in my office that, and they're often quite pumped full of adrenaline, actually. They, they're really sort of in on full, full mode all the time just to battle through the day um, and navigate through. And it has got something to do with interoception, I promise. So, you know, what's she going on about? Why is she talking about this on an interoception talk? Um, and it is really relevant. And I'm going to just do a few more slides and then I'm going to come full circle and explain exactly 
um, why I want to stress this. So facts about interoception. Interoception allows us to feel our internal organs and skin and gives information regarding the internal state or condition of our body. So it does an awful lot. And this is why it's so fascinating. And, and you probably already know about it anyway. If you, and if you don't, I, I can't urge you strongly enough to, to go and find out more about it. It's really fascinating. Um, and when I became aware of it, it intrigued me that you can have a system that is responsible for, you know, recognizing those signals in the body that are telling you that you're hungry, that you're thirsty, that you're in pain, that you're cold, um, your eyes are heavy, but also how you're feeling, whether you're, you're anxious, you know, um, agitated, multitude of different things, and it's responsible for all of those things. And it started to make sense for me of a mystery that had, um, if I'm honest, inspired me to study. Um, and that, that was my oldest um, and really wanted to understand um, exactly what was going on with him. And for many years, I, I thought that he was masking and I still think he was to a huge extent. But it started to dawn on me that a lot of the times he didn't know when he was not OK. He was not getting the signal. He wasn't getting the memo, if you like, until it was too late to kind of put the brakes on. Um, and it made sense of so many things. Um, and also in my experience as a, as a, as a volunteer at this point, um, hearing from countless people saying there was no warning before a meltdown. Um, it just happened, you know, very suddenly. Um, and actually that can be because the individual is not getting the signs that they are not okay. They are not getting the signals from the brain um, that, you know, oh, actually, I need to make these adjustments to get myself back on track. Um, and then obviously, by the time, you know, they get those signals, they're already on the on the cost of being completely overwhelmed. Um, so it made sense of a lot of things for me. Um, so if you are an individual that perhaps struggles to remember to eat, drink, um, but also struggles to understand how you're feeling or recognize how you're feeling, um, it could be related to interoception. Um, and I would encourage you to find out more about it. Um, so the control center for interoception is the insular area in the brain. I didn't know there was an insular area in the brain. Um, so, you know, lots and lots of fascinating things to find out about. Um, and interoception is connected to being able to regulate emotions, um, which obviously, you know, makes a lot of sense because we use the signals from our body to know how we feel. Um, so, you know, I know if my eyes feel really heavy, I'm tired. I know if my stomach is really rumbly, I may need to go and get something to eat. Or, you know, if, if there's an achy feeling, I'm, I'm, I'm need to get something to eat so I recognize those signs in my body um, and think oh actually I need to go and, and do these things but I work with a number of people over the years that you know I've had to remind them to drink um, my husband's one of those people you have to remind to drink and eat and um, just doesn't doesn't occur to him um, whereas I just don't have that problem I'm always wanting to <laughs> eat and drink I get those signals all the time um so yeah you know it, it made a lot of sense to me um I, you know I used to be an autism mentor for university students and you know people that were doing masters that could do really you know fantastic academic work but they would forget to drink every single day because they weren't recognizing those signals in their body and so I would be regularly prompting them um to drink so this is a resource that I would really recommend. Um, so I'm going to sort of recommend some stuff to you that, that isn't free, um, but Kelly Marler um, does do an awful lot of stuff that is free. And um, she's written a fantastic book, which I'll show you in a minute, that I would highly recommend if, if you're interested in this subject. Um, but you can get lots of free resources from her. Um, and if you're on social media, um, she has a um, Facebook page, which they share um, good practice as well between professionals. 
um, but share resources. Her website, there's lots of free downloadables. Um, so um, I've put you the link there. Um, so this is um, one of her free resources. So interoception is a sense that allows us to notice internal body signals like a growling stomach, racing heart, tense muscles or full bladder. When we notice these body signals, our brain uses them as clues to our emotions. Interoception helps us to feel many important emotions, including, and then you can see you've got loads of things there, um, suggestions, and it really is all encompassing, isn't it? It's um, controlling so many different aspects of your body. Um, so, you know, common signs of interoception difference can include um, some of these. So you don't need to have all of these, you just have some of them. So recognizing when you're hungry, full or thirsty. Um, it can cause problems with toilet training or um, what we see in our house is very much last minute. So a very, you know, late run for the toilet. Um, it's like only just get the, um, the sensation that you need to go just before. Um, overly sensitive or not sensitive enough to pay. I've got a variety of different combinations in our house. Some are over, some are under. Um, some don't know when they're ill. Some are very hypersensitive. Um, identifying emotions. I think most of the individuals in our house struggle with that one. Um, Identifying emotions in others, we, we've got varying degrees of that. I've got I've got one very hyper empathetic, very hyper tuned. If if I'm not quite right downstairs, Georgie will sense upstairs that I'm not quite right and come down and seek me out. Um, but we also do have the the other extreme where lots of um, difficulty understanding emotions in the, in themselves and others and identifying. Um, Recognizing those building signs of distress um, and independently using coping strategies during times of distress. I think that this is, um, these are massive issues that we experience in our house. Um, it'd be interesting to see um, if that's the same for, for you all too. Um, so, Kelly Marler, and the reason I use her a lot is she's kind of like the leading sort of um, expert in this area. Um, I'll just show you her book actually while I've so you can tell I like it because I've got if I like something I have lots of tabs which is great unless one of my dogs get it because the cavapoo likes to pull these out <laughs> which is very annoying um so it's interoception the eighth sensory system it's fantastic um but it is about 25 pounds so um, if you can get the free resources get the free resources um so Marla describes interoception as being like our body's petrol tank. So we get the signals in our body's petrol tank. I think it's more like the petrol gauge personally or the dashboard of the car. Um, but you get the general idea. So we get those signals. Um, hence the prompt of the you know, petrol filling up thing. I'm trying to remember what the name of it is. Um, but our body reacts then to the signals that we that we get and it responds in the necessary way. Um, and really, you know, comparing difficulties with interception with the petrol tank not working in a car, I think is quite helpful. The analogy I sort of quite like really is getting in and the dashboard of your car not working at all. Because to me, that insular, it seems to me to be like a dashboard. It, it seems to be controlling lots of different things in your body. So it's like getting in your car, looking at your dashboard. It's not working. I'm trying to have to guess and try and have to work out exactly whether you've got the means to say, I don't know, go from Winsford to Edinburgh. And you're going to have to guess it. And you might get it right. You might kind of work out whether you've got enough petrol or you might get it completely and utterly wrong. Um, you might get it right, but by the time you get to Edinburgh, you're totally exhausted because the whole way there, you've been worried, am I going to run out of petrol at any moment? I have no idea what's going to happen at all. Um, and that to me is, you know, sort of explains what it might be like having difficulty with interoception. Certainly an underactive interoceptive system. So if we don't recognise the signals in our body, then we often rely on learning the rules and working everything out instead of using instinct. And this brings us back to this 
exhaustion that we talked about at the start, um, working things cognitively, working it, you know, top down by rote, um, and, you know, preparing what you're going to say and do all the time. And it's that classic analogy, um, which certainly describes several members of my family of being like swans. So just gliding on the surface, but underneath they're paddling like mad frantically. And for years and years, I think at my worst, I was having 15 hours of meetings a week to try and get mental health professionals in particular to understand that a member of my family was really, really suffering terribly. And it, you know, it was it was impacting. I mean, they were indicators of distress, you know, not challenging behavior, although, you know, that was the label that was put on it. Massive indicators of distress and no one was listening to me. Um, and it was impacting on the mental health of everybody, um, you know, and in, in the home as well. And in the end, it was just easier to do it myself than to actually, you know, try and get people to believe me. And then years later, what do you know? We're talking about masking. We're talking about camouflage. We're talking about interoception. And they are leading, you know, the way in, in research um, and also a very particularly masking and camouflaging. Um, is a is the main factor in poor mental health outcomes for autistic individuals so actually I was kind of on the right track all along and many of you you know with some of the things that you will say and people won't are not listening to you you know you are the experts in what it's like to be autistic you're talking about your the individuals that you care for or autistic individuals you know you have such important things to say and one of the important topics that comes across time and time again is this exhaustion. Um, and really a lot of the time the onus is put on the autistic individual, in my opinion, you know, just tell people how you're feeling, you know, um, and actually what, what if you don't know how you're feeling? What if you are not getting those signals um, or you're not aware that you're masking, you know, as, as, a, as a different issue? Um, we're putting all the onus on the autistic person all of the time rather than helping them to navigate the world. And hopefully when you come and visit us, the West Cheshire Hub, you'll feel that we're helping you um, to navigate all those unwritten social and communication rules. So research regarding interoception. Um, as I say, there's, there's an increase in this area and um, thankfully there's more, um, more research coming through. I've just picked um, one for you. Um, I have to point out, I have got a particular interest in under, um, underactive interoceptive awareness, you know, not picking up those signals. Um, but you can be over responsive as well. Um, but my particular interest is in is in that. Um, and that's probably supported by um, research like um, Fien and Brownlow here reporting that autistic individuals um, had diminished interoceptive awareness. And they state that it could impact on many aspects of a person's life. So including physical and mental health, social interactions, self-awareness and communication. So related to this um, are a certain issues um, to do with self-regulation and also um, something called alexithymia or timia. Um, Linda, Dr. Linda Buchanan could probably correct me on how it's supposed to be <laughs> pronounced. We've got a word coming up in a few slides and um, I'm really not sure I'm gonna pronounce that correctly. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, so autistic individuals often find it difficult, as you know, to describe how they are feeling. Um, Alexithymia or timia is the ability to identify and describe how you are feeling to others. Um, don't all feel like you need to rush out and try and get a diagnosis. Um, it's a construct, not a condition that is, is diagnosable. It's not just limited to individuals who are autistic. Um, I myself have, have, did struggle with it um, for or probably up until my thirties, um, and do need that time to process how I'm feeling. Sometimes I'm, I don't know that I'm not okay myself. Um, so it is um, there's a high occurrence with with autism, um, and alexithymia and um, interoception differences are very closely related. I always love quotes from autistic people. Um, and um, for those of you who've read the, the book, 
um, by Cynthia Kim. Um, trying to remember the title, Nerdy Shine Inappropriate. It's a quite long title, but it's, it's a really good book. Um, so she says, sometimes those emotions are hard to identify because they are muted or jumbled up. Sometimes they're hard to identify because they're overwhelmingly intense. So different experiences um, described by her there. So I've snuck a picture of my dashboard in, haven't I, just to, <laughs> just to help um, with the analogies that we're using today. Um, so self-regulation is closely related to these systems of interoception and alexithymia or timia. Um, Self-regulation is being able to control and adapt systems such as emotional regulation, executive functioning and sensory integration. And difficulties with interoception impact on the ability as it's the system that drives our self-regulation behaviours. And really, you know, it goes without saying that if you don't know how you're feeling, you're not going to be able to self-regulate and make all those little adjustments. Um, I sort of think of it as those old fashioned scales that, you know, you put weights on one side and then you, you sort of titrate them to level them out. And, and I make lots of different little micro adjustments throughout my day, um, particularly as I've become aware, more aware of self-care as I've got older. And I make all these little adjustments and think, oh, you know, I need a little bit of downtime later. I need a bit, little time to listen to my audio book or... You know, I need to check in with myself, I need to go and get something to eat. And I make all these little adjustments and, and I'm, nine times out of ten, I'm, I'm aware of, of what I need to do. Um, but if you're not getting those signals and you're not um, you're not getting those memos, then you're not going to make those adjustments. And you're going to struggle with self-regulation. So unless we know how we are feeling, we can't possibly begin to regulate ourselves. In this way, difficulties with alexithymia and interoception dif differences can contribute to high levels of anxiety, exhaustion and overwhelm, to name but a few. Um, burnout, um, like I say, is a particular interest of mine or avoiding autistic burnout. So... What can we do about it? The good news is, and this is why um, resources like Kelly Marler's um, Facebook page, or her website, her book, um, but also um, I can send these to you, um, Axia, so you can share. A um, couple of free resources, I like free resources. It's actually, if you put it in Google, the Government of South Australia, who knew? One is a school resource, but there's no reason why you can't incorporate some of these aspects into your life too, because you know, autism is lifelong, as we were discussing earlier. <laughs> it's, it's ready to learn, and it's really big. It's got lots of different resources in it. But one is, is not age-specific. It's Interoception 201. I must, there must have also been another one, 101, I presume. I don't know. Um, but the, the leading academic in it is uh, Dr. Emma Goodall. Um, but it's absolutely full of ideas of activities that you can incorporate into your day to day life to promote increased interoceptive awareness. Um, so, some really, really good tips in there. Um, one of which is actually in Kelly Marler's book. Um, I'll just show you now um, and it, you could do it very easily yourself without forking out in the book and it's just basically like a giant gingerbread man um, and we have done it in our house on quite a few occasions um, and I'm, I'm not going to pretend it didn't take quite a lot of revisiting because it did um, because because Jack my oldest is, didn't really have any awareness at all of any of those signs but Coming back and two and having a few sessions with the gingerbread man and also having words alongside sort of in words that we could use to prompt different areas of our body. Um, we sort of realized that there were a few very small signs. So eyelashes, it blinks a lot more when I'm starting to build up. Things that he wasn't doing as well were indicators. So um, not eating, going to the toilet more frequently and then we could use those as indicators that thing that things weren't okay um, and also flag it up to other people and um, so Kelly and Marla describes how um, interoceptive awareness is something that can be encouraged and developed um, 
be patient. It will take quite a bit of time. She does emphasize that in her book and also, you know, regards to increasing self-regulation skills. It needs a lot of practice um, and repetition. Um, so she recommends regularly checking in with your body and asking yourself questions about the various parts of your body um, at regular intervals through your day. I started to incorporate it with my family life and, and I think they thought, I hope mum's off, what she's what she been reading again. Because um, I started to do a, a running commentary on my um, interoceptive the signals in my body. So I started to say things more like, oh, my eyes feel heavy. And I, <laughs> I've got a lot of teenagers, teenagers in my house. They're all like, all right, OK. Um, uh, what's she on? What's she, what's she going on about now? Um, but doing a commentary about my interoception, my body signals, you know, my stomach is rumbling, I must be hungry. You know, I think they all think I'm mad anyway. Um, but just, you know, modeling good interoceptive language um, and doing it more often. Um, but also regularly checking in, I know some really, really good, um, that's actually a high school, um, fantastic um, teacher is now the education advisor for Studio 3, so um, does um, the low arousal approach, but he would regularly check in with his students on their heart rate to see how, what the heart rate was, and that would be an indicator of, you know, whether they're stressed and when they need time out, and I know a lot of autistic adults do have like, you know, Fitbits or any other device, doesn't have to be. <laughs> I'm trying to think of another name now, so I'm not endorsing one device, but you know, they do use that as an indicator and just check in that they, they might not be OK. Um, so we did a bit of a prompt at the West Cheshire Hub just to help because it can be quite hard um, to check in on various aspects of your body. So this resource is on our website. Um, if it isn't, let me know. I'm sure it is. But if it isn't, just oh. Let me know and um, I'll get it to you. Um, so we've got a little bit here that's blocked, but, you know, brain um, checking in, you know, asking yourself how you feel. And you, you might need a list of words um, to prompt you. Um, and we, that's something we could help help you with. Um, so checking in when different environments, you know, how you're feeling when in a crowded place. Um, when you're reading a book, watching TV, um, your, your mouth, how does it feel when you're drinking hot and cold drinks, humming, brushing of teeth. Um, so again, I think look at how we, we need to have a list alongside it um, so that we've got words to prompt you. Um, so let's, let's see. So our mouth, we could say um, tense, we could say relaxed. Um, if you're eating spicy food, it might be tingly, um, it could be dry. Um, you might have some more ideas you want to put in the, in the chat box. I'm trying to find my list of words for you. Um, let's see. I'll find it as soon as I come off from this phone tag. So stomach and bladder, checking in regularly, um, how it feels before, after a meal, going over bumps in the car particularly if you've got a full bladder and um, all these things that they seem quite, you know, trivial, but it's helping you to sort of recognize those signals in your body. And the more you do it, the more you're aware of it, you will become um, good excuse to put hand cream on um, and foot cream. You know, how does it feel when you're putting, putting those on and, um, you know, when you've got a hot water bottle and um, all those different checking in with different aspects of your body. Freezer aisle of the supermarket is a massive problem for us. It's a massive trigger. Um, so it's quite obvious for certain members of my family how they're feeling in, 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 in that area. Um, and we do know that that is something that we, we don't really go into very often. Um, exercising, you know, how you feel when you're surprised, when you're climbing steps, just really like these constant checking in with these parts of your body um, and even your nose, you know, I'm, I know several individuals that smells can be a real, real trigger um, or cold air. Eyes, um, for, certainly for my oldest Jack, sunlight is, is a, a real problem. And we realized that the rapid blinking was to do with the, the sunlight um, being too bright. So, you know, drawing the blinds, um, certainly when he was at school at the time, um, was re really, really helpful. Um, and hearing, checking in with, you know, 
understanding and, and sort of it really helped my husband to to realize about um I picked up that that his processing was was very different in a room where there was overlapping conversations um so it's just feeding that back as well with the people that you're caring for because sometimes you you know what's what's difficult and other times you don't so really what we've got is these body maps in our house now for different individuals and they are very different in my house um, couldn't get more different actually <laughs> between one member and another um so we, we you know have very sensory seeking and very sensory avoiding we have one person that's very aware of of all the little the little changes and, and nuances that they're feeling and very tuned into their interoceptive system we've got another that really um needs as many clues as possible um and as many check-ins as possible so what I became fascinated with is the fact that mindfulness, when I started looking at mental health, um, which is another real interest of mine um, in, in regards to autism, um, that mindfulness actually um, increases functioning and you can show on the brain scans of the insular area of the brain. So if we're wanting to improve that functioning of that area, um, that mindfulness is something that can really um, help with that. But then I've been talking to autistic people and they, they have got a few problems with mindfulness, which I'll come to um, in a minute. So mindfulness can be defined as paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. And like I say, taking part in mindfulness meditation um, is reported to be associated with improvement in the functioning of the insular area in the brain. When I've spoken to a lot of autistic people, um, other than our mindful se mindfulness sessions, which have been delivered by an autistic person, and I've had very good reports from, um, a lot of autistic adults that I know have said that they really struggle with mindfulness. They struggle trying to actually do it the minute they think that they they should be doing and um, doing a mindful activity. They then really don't feel that way at all. So this is something that's really important is you could try mindfulness in a sort of roundabout way. So you could try doing flow activities. And this is that word that I said that I'm going to really struggle with to say. So cheek senti my high, something like that, <laughs> his name. <laughs> um, Anybody want to do it for me? <laughs> it's better. Any takers? No. <laughs> um, so he came up with this idea of flow and psychological flow. And I've talked about it a few times in terms of mental health and then realised myself that I wasn't doing it. So it's good for everybody's mental health, but it might be an, a better way for you to do it um, and do mindfulness as an autistic individual. I'll show you this this quote here. Oh, I can just get mine. So cultivating flow as a mental habit of happiness. And it's something that I've been advising to lots of people and then realized I wasn't really doing it myself. And it's very individual. So for me, you can see my piano here. So for me, I get flow when I'm playing um French piano music, classical music. So Chopin, Debussy. Um a friend who I met for dinner last night, she gets flow when she's running. That for me would not give me flow at all. It would have the exact opposite effect on me. But lots of people I know do get it with flow, um, do get it with running. Um, Jack's experiencing it at the moment with chess. Again, that would not work for me. <laughs> he starts to explain chess to me and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's the opposite of flow. Um, so really it is a very personal thing and, and taking the time to realise what your flow activity is. Another one for me is reading journal articles, autism journal articles, which most people, some people would think that was strange. Linda Buchanan might also experience that. So I, I love sitting there with my highlighter pen and my journal article. Printed copy, it's got to be, not on my screen, and I'm highlighting. But it could be your Kindle, it could be um, knitting, could be doing any activity like that. Um, so that the key factors are that it's got to be something that absorbs you, that is not so easy that you don't have to really think about it, but not so hard that it puts you off. So that's why the chest kind of falls down for me. Um, so it's a mental state of being where you are completely absorbed or in the zone. That lovely feeling that you get where you stop thinking about your emails or what you need to do. So um, 
I realised that my mental health was going a bit off kilter, working too hard. So I realised I needed to factor in somewhere swimming. So um, I'm, I'm restarted that a couple of times a week and that works for me. So somewhere about 15 minutes in, I stopped thinking about my emails or what I've got to do. So it's me more likely to be experienced when the activity is neither too demanding or too easy and where there are clear goals and feedback. Um, so it, you know, it could be playing an instrument. Interestingly, you know, we quite often worry or I get reports of um, carers worrying about their autistic family members gaming too much. But actually, you could be experiencing flow whilst you're gaming. So, um, you know, sometimes we do worry about things um, that perhaps we, we, we don't need to. So whilst you're doing these flow activities and incorporating into your life, um, that can be a way of improving that interaction and interoception, regularly checking in with your body um, and, you know, these doing these body scans and other activities that you can pick up on these, these freebies, um, like I say, this interoceptive, um, these free interoceptive guides. Um, can help develop your interoceptive awareness and your self-regulation um, awareness too. Um, so I think we're nearly coming towards the end. So the benefits of developing interoceptive awareness, well, you know, we looked at the start, we did, we looked at all these areas that it governs. And, you know, there's so many different areas. It is really like that dashboard of a car. So there are so many um, benefits to it. And as our interoceptive awareness increases, we can start to become aware of emotions before they are too overwhelming. So um, not getting you know, this memo that I was talking about before. If, if 100 is complete and utter massive explosion on the, on the Richter scale, if you like, for um, a couple of our family members and many of the people that I, I see um, at, at the hub, they are only realizing at say 99.5. Um, whereas if you start to recognize those signals more in your body, you might start to get those memo, memos earlier, you know, at 80, 70, 60, you can start to put in um, steps. But other people can start recognizing, um, you know, like I've done with, with my son Jack, start recognizing signs quite, quite early, early on, um, and we can put things into place. And then we can start to take steps to regulate how we feel, you know, just in the same way as if our dashboard on our car um, flashes, um, we know that we need to put water in, we know we need to put oil in, we know we need to go and get petrol, um, or, you know, we need to slow down, we might be um, going too fast, so we need to put the brake on, and it's the same very much with ourselves. So thank you very much for um, I always like to talk about autism, so hopefully um, you may want to have me back in the future and um, we can do different topics and um, please suggest topics to me um, and my, my role is supposed to be strategic so it's a good, it's good excuse to go and have some time where I can get to do writing and um, <laughs> actually research for talks and things. Um, then I can have some flow in my life and get some flow of activities incorporated in. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Um, we do really look forward to welcoming you when um, we're getting more and more volunteers and our volunteers are virtually 90% of them are autistic. So we're really trying to, um, just hang on a second, my neighbor's just asking me a question. Just one second. Actually, it won't be one second, it'll be more like 30. <laughs> Okay, so once Karen's come back, then we'll go through. There was quite a lot of questions coming through in the chat box there, so um, we'll come back. Yeah, so okay. I did that neurotypical thing, didn't I, of saying one second and it's not one second? See what I mean? <laughs> we just do it all the time, which is so confusing. Um, so we look forward to welcoming you, um, either myself or Donna or our volunteers, um, most of which are autistic. And um, my son, Jack, who I've mentioned a few times today, he's on um, day release, if you like, from um, Greenbank Special School. Um, 
actually is at college and he's loving that environment and he's never been one to want to kind of admit to being autistic but now I'm hearing him saying to people you know it's okay to be it's okay to be different and uh, so it's working for my family members too um I hope to see you very soon and to um if you've not already come to welcome you in person um, and to have you at one of our drop-ins or one, our one, one of our one-to-one -one appointments. So, 26 yeah. box, 26 <laughs> messages yeah. in the chat box. There's been some good comments. Um, I think a lot of them are comments more than questions, so I'll just go through and then if there's anything you want to add to it. Um, so we've had, uh, I think PTSD dissociation adds to our inability to recognize the pain and toilet needs and hunger, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, someone else said, I think that they have some interoception difficulties with hunger and um, they can go all day without food and often don't yeah. realize this until their head is pounding. Um, other people have, you know, with difficulties with their emotional regulation and often ask themselves like I'm in tears why what's happened yeah. um uh, someone said it annoys me that people use your IQ as a measure of being able to identify these feelings um it affects our abilities to make or enforce boundaries too yeah um we've had luckily I'm addicted to tea so I drink that all the time otherwise <laughs> I drink anything <laughs> I'm addicted to coffee so <laughs> in fact they're gonna have some now uh we've had uh so this is following on with the IQ thing that's just wrong there is such a difference between IQ and EQ the two aren't even comparable brilliant yeah yeah absolutely um, brilliant yeah shouldn't oh I'm gonna try it now Alexithymia, alexithymia, I don't know, be an inability to understand. I think there was a bit of a confusion. Could you just clarify whether it's the ability to understand or inability? It's the inability. Yeah, okay, that's great. Thank Sorry you. if I put that wrong on the slide. No, it's fine. <laughs> um, Long work hours at the moment. <laughs> um someone's also said i go from no hunger at all to absolutely ravenous in an instant is yeah. that interoception yes and this is what this is what this is what i noticed in my son so um you know not needing the toilet then absolutely bursting not being hungry and then literally you know yeah. raising <laughs> the cupboards it's so it, it, it's at the point that your brain gets the signal and your body gets the signal that that you need those things. So whereas I will get them much, much earlier, much more gradually. Um, certain, you know, particularly, particularly my oldest, he, he'll only get it once it's really, really extreme. Mm -hmm. So it goes from not knowing that he's not okay to completely, absolutely, definitely in crisis within a split second. Um, so that, you know, that explains so much really um, and made sense of so many things. <laughs> and I don't um, think enough professionals or schools or in, in you know um whether we're talking about children whether we're talking about um in the workforce I don't think people it's certainly not something people are aware of say in social care and meetings with social care they're just that they're not they don't have any understanding of, of lots of these issues so this is something we need to really work on from a strategic point of view increasing their understanding and education I was just going to add to that. It's just made me think. Um, there's someone I know who will be absolutely like not hungry at all, and then like that, a ravenous, as mm -hmm. someone else has just said. And then because they think they're so hungry, all of a sudden they'll eat a lot. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my god, I'm stuffed. Do you think that's kind of the whole miss of the communication of the signals and stuff as well? I, I suspect so, and I just think we're in just scratching the surface with interoception because I mean that's just food, isn't it? And I know lots of individuals, and you know, as a parent, I have to hide food in my house because <laughs> I've got a couple of individuals. If they see like twenty packets of crisps, they'll all go, um, and then it's like they don't. There seems to be like a delay then, so we're you know we they get the signal that they've had enough. So it, that could be interoception, or it could be sensory feedback that because it seems to be certain items in my house, crunchy ones in particular, um, that seem to seem to be the popular things. Yeah. Um, 
so I, you know I think it's to do with the sensory feedback but yeah certainly I mean my husband won't mind me saying you know you'll go all day and not not eat anything um I won't even go to the toilet I keep saying to him you're like a camel because <laughs> you've been out oh well, you've been out from eight o'clock in the morning we'll come in at eight o'clock at night and you're not been to the toilet yeah. I mean I'm quite impressed because I've got like the bladder of like a mosquito but you know <laughs> <laughs> but you know he hasn't had that signal so he's, well, then he's absolutely desperate um but the eating and the drinking thing you know it's a it's a concern and also like you know pain if somebody's not feeling pain you know that they're not going to know that they're ill, you know, or they've got an appendicitis. It could be something quite, you know, so always look out for warning signs in, in, a, in if you're a carer, always look out for warning signs. Or if you're an autistic person, tell people that are close to you, you need to look out for, you know, real changes in behaviour, yeah. you know, indicators of distress. Um, okay, great. Um, we've had another comment. Does this get worse when hyperfixating on a hobby or special interest? I often forget to eat or drink when doing those. Other times I'm hyper aware and think I am ill, such as when I'm tired, etc. Yeah, like I say, I'm not a, I'm not an OT. So, you know, I'm not really, really specialist. But in my opinion, I would say definitely yes. And, and I think it relates to that monotropic theory of autism. So that's your single channel. Um, as opposed to me that I'm very multi-channel so I've got you know I wish I could switch some of my channels off in my brain sometimes so they're all you know I've got all these different thoughts pinging around my head and um, the autistic brain tends to be it so that singular channeled focus which can can lead to absolute brilliance and you know that hyper focus but then quite often it it's shutting off that awareness of other things and really, I always say to, to people, because I, I deliver parent training courses as well, you know, and they're saying, well, I can't reach my child. Well, we'll go through whichever channel's open. You, if you're trying to go through the channel that's not open, it's going to be harder to get to get through and, and to get engagement. Um, so really, it's the analogy I use is that train track. And that's why it can be so, you know, for me, if, say, a friend cancels, I've got, I'll be disappointed, but I, I, I can change my track. But for the autistic individual, it's much harder, isn't it? Because you're on that monotropic, that train track thought. But yeah, I would say I, it, it, I think it does exacerbate it. Um, in my experience, what I'm seeing uh, in my family life, definitely. Yeah. Um, we've got this term, the interception was mentioned in my AXI report. I subsequently asked my GP about it with the hope for more exploration. He didn't know what it was and looked it up online during our telephone appointment. Um, thank you so much for sharing this information and bringing more clarity and insight. You're welcome. We need to get it out there, don't we? Because it's, yeah. I mean, I, I found out about a lot of things that cast a lot of, um, sort of provides me with a lot of explanation of things that, that I'd spent years trying to get support for. And the, the, we shouldn't all have to go off to uni to go and study autism to find out, you know, it's slightly ridiculous so you know yeah you do you go to people don't you thinking that they will know and they I've been told by you know a psychiatrist that my son saw years ago that there was only five senses and I'm like there isn't <laughs> you're that adamant that there was so you know and I mean it's like no there is not there are more senses than that yeah so I I don't quite understand it so we, we need to just keep campaigning don't we and get this information out there um mm because there's so much to learn and you know about the more I learn about autism the more I want to learn so um you know keep suggesting things for me to talk about <laughs> please uh it then goes on to talk about um mindfulness and then flow um and someone said or they asked if it was kind of like I don't know if you've seen the film Soul the Pixar movie I haven't but there's, I want to see it now <laughs> uh, there's a part where they kind of when they get into the zone as they call it in the yeah, film it would be that um, yeah and they were asking whether that kind of relates to flow of them you know in the activity and forgetting the kind of the outside world um and then someone else has added that they think it's kind of like hyper focus as well so how it's all kind of linked yeah yeah I, I think it's permission to do those things that that give you flow and you know that may be stimming but it may be it may not be it may be something you know that you're that you're interested in or an activity it could be several things um and it's good for everybody 
Um, but I think for autistic people, it's really important because you might really struggle with those traditional mindful activities. You know, if somebody said to you, go and sit on a mat and meditate, you might you might be great at it. I mean, I, I struggle with it personally myself um, because I'm just sitting there thinking of things that I need to do. Um, so I'm, I'm better with something like, let's go and play the piano or let's go for a swim. I'm better with that. And I know a lot of autistic people that is their experience too, but obviously, you know, I can't speak for everybody who's autistic. Um, but when you're autistic and you're really experiencing, you know, what we've been talking about today, battling through a world that is not designed to meet your needs, it should be, but it unfortunately isn't. Um, and, you know, you're battling through a world that's not designed to meet your needs. And also you're navigating all those social rules that govern interaction that are unwritten that loads of other people seem to know and you don't and you're battling all of that so actually you need to do your utmost to sort of charge and replenish your energy and social and emotional energy supply so if you can do things like flow activities do them as much as possible I say mm -hmm. and put yourselves in environments where people accept you for who you are um and you know you can you can be yourself so come and visit us <laughs> uh there's a few more comments but i think just um conscious of time i'm gonna yeah. just there's one that i think might be more beneficial um someone's poor i live in manchester can i get a one-to-one -one video appointment if so how do i organize this i think a lot of our people come from all over so i think yeah if there was yeah. a way whether they could have some sort of contact yeah um that'd be very beneficial yeah, I'm, I'd never like to turn people away. I'm sure there's a way we can sort it. Um, we might, you might have to wait a month or two because of appointment times, but I'll, I can always, you know, give you cancellation or something like that. So that, where there's a will, there's a way, I say. Yeah. <laughs> so we can get in touch about that, you know, even if we just do like a regular appointment slots, you know, for Axia, just I'm sure we're keen to work in partnership with each other. So yeah, definitely. You know, it's a way. That's <laughs> There's so a way. <laughs> yeah, well, um, so, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, Karen, do you want to put the best email address for people to use in the chat box? We'll put it, when we put the recording online, we'll put the info in there as well, but just so we yeah. have got it now, um, that, that would be helpful. Yeah, I'm just putting my address in now, um, which is direct to me. Due to workload, I might have to delegate it out, but you know it's me that's seen it straight away. If it's booking, if actual booking any of the activities, you're best going to um, Jess. Um, if in doubt, email any of us. Because yeah. <laughs> we, we don't want anybody being confused. Perfect. That's brilliant. Thanks for that, Karen. Um, okay, so now then for the, the last little section, um, we're going to have Kyle is going to share sort of um, gift um, ideas, I suppose. So I'll, I'll pass over to Kyle. He'll explain that a lot better than I will. Um, but yeah. let's have a look. Sort out my Christmas shopping, please. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Get ahead. Um, right, Kyle, I'm going to ask you to unmute there. Did that work? Right. Um, has everyone got the hands up feature ready? Because I might need a bit of extra information on this one. Um, hands up if you're trying to get the new consoles for anyone, anyone at all, at all, because unfortunately I've got bad news on that one. I've got very, very bad news, unfortunately. Um, you're not getting it from the first hand market for not only this Christmas period, most of next year, you will not be able to get a PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series X. X. those consoles uh, are still having huge trouble with getting their supply chains going because of the chip shortage. So you're out of luck. So I'm, uh, you're going to have to spend a bit more, I think, to get it from a second-hand market, I'm afraid. afraid if, you if you haven't already purchased one now, you can sign up for stock alerts all you want. Oh, you, oh you, I signed up for stock alerts and all that, and it's very good, but I'm telling you right now, the worldwide chip shortage means we're going to see a slower production of these consoles 
going into most of next year. It could even go into 2023 at this point, according to some of my sources. Um, on the plus side, there are a whole bunch that's come out and is coming out. Um, I've worked with Reese and Elliot a bit on this one to get a, a good comprehensive list together. And we've found that, um, we found that we felt for, um, for if you have, if you have managed to get a PlayStation 5, uh, the top games right now uh, for kids, and I'd say anyone actually, but kids particularly will love this, uh, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. It just got nominated last night for Game of the Year at the Video Game Oscars. Uh, but there's also for teens to adults, um, Returnal is also an excellent game for PlayStation 5 owners. That one I think you should be really picking up. And... Um, as, as much as I didn't like it, I know a bunch of people did like this game and it did get a nomination for Game of the Year. Uh, Deathloop should be on your, raid, on your radar. The, I personally don't think the game's very good, but I'm, I'm going to be... Uh, but it has some good features to it, I would say. That's the point. It's good in parts. Xbox owners, if they don't have Game Pass, you need to be getting them Game Pass. It's so... It, it's such a great get a great feature you get hun you're spending 15 pounds a month but you're getting a 100 plus games and a free trial to disney plus for your money um ah well that's a good point any good japanese style rpgs uh due out they'll be available on pc um i'm gonna uh, go with elliot's um recommendation on this one and recommend Tales of Arise. I think that one would suit your um your would suit your pop suit you very well, Nathan, on that part. It's got a very innovative battle system. Uh, for Xbox owners, I would also recommend if you're buying an extra forum, uh go for Halo and Forza. They are the big Christmas buy-ins at this time. <laughs> Horizon, I've been playing Halo Infinite's multiplayer since it released early and it's been fantastic um switch owners you want metroid dread psychonauts 2 is very good elliot but you cannot purchase it physically it's not no physical versions exist you have to purchase it digitally at this point in time physical version is due out next year um all ages you've got metroid dread and reese would kill me if i didn't mention Monster Hunter Rise and Monster Hunter Stories 2. Um, but for, fam for the family getting together at Christmas, the two games you want on Switch for a great in-person multiplayer and online multiplayer as well, Mario 3D World plus Bowser's Fury, and the one that I need to play with Reese and Elliot and Ren at some point, but we haven't got around to it yet, uh, Mario Party Superstars. How that wasn't nominated for a best multiplayer game, I have no idea. Uh, as for the multi-plats, uh, further to Nathan's point, um, uh, uh, the, another great um, RPG for him that's also on PC, uh, Neo The World Ends With You, that's got brilliant soundtrack. Anime fans uh, should pick up Demon Slayer. So yeah, that's available on all consoles. And Resident Evil Village also got nominated for um uh, for game of the year so i would really recommend picking that one up here's the avoids though do not pick the uh, do not pick these up right now because these need patches they cannot you cannot pick these up in their current state i don't care how much they want them do not pick them up grand theft auto trilogy definitive definitive edition elliot's got it on his switch it's so broken that it was downright unplayable it's got graphical glitches through the roof. Um, you just have to, uh, I, I picked it up on, play, on Xbox. It had the rain going upwards. I got stuck under a bridge at one point. I was, um, my, I managed to pull off the trick of making a car go side to side so that it would grow out of nowhere. It is so unplayable. I'm, I've just uninstalled it and I went and bought a second hand copy of the Xbox 360 version. Oh, and Elliot's just pointed out 
uh, that the character models are so mangled that it's, un that it's unwatchable. Reese also insisted that I mention Guardians of the Galaxy. I know a lot of people might be looking into it, to it but I'd say hold off right now because it does need patches. Reese mentioned in his review he ran into five soft locks and, were and was unable to continue the game. Hopefully that's given you a good idea. We're doing it, but if you want a bit more, we are doing a podcast tomorrow about the Game Awards nominations. So we'll give you a bit more of an idea of what we think about. Them. So that will give you a bit of an idea of the games that we really enjoyed. Uh, someone's saying, I haven't found many age of issues so far, but I'm playing on PC. Oh, Reese said eight soft locks and two hard crashes he had. So yeah, no, that game needs a patch before it's really want to be purchasing it. Anyway, that's my lot. Thank you very much. Oh, is there a few more coming through? Yeah, you're on now. Perfect. Thanks for that, Kyle. Good um, insight, useful tips as always. Um, and thanks so much, Karen. We've had a double whammy, two presentations from you today. So that's brilliant. And some interesting points made in the chat. Yeah. So that's fab. Um, as we said, this will be recorded. Dream will have it edited and uploaded, usually with, within the week. So keep an eye. Um, something I also wanted to mention was some of you may already know this and I'm sure you're signed up already but on our website on the oh, right hand side there is a part where you can put in your email address and it will send um, notifications to your inbox when you post so things like the podcast and also when the um, the videos of the recordings of the groups are uploaded so you don't have to sort of keep an eye for it it'll just let you know um, so yeah something that you might want to want to look into um, Looking forward to the, the next session then. We'll be in January now. Um, we'll be closed for um, around about two weeks over Christmas. So that will mean that their next group will be in January. Um, we haven't finalised the date as yet, but as soon as we know, we'll pop that on, on the website and let you know. Um, sorry, oh, oh, sorry yeah, I almost forgot. I almost forgot. Um, uh, uh, me and Elliot uh, insisted that one of the things that people really should be looking out for for Switch owners is Pokemon, Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. We, it's not out yet, so we could be sending you into a mess, but we've got very, a lot of confidence that we think it's going to be great. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, we'll give you some more information as soon as we know regarding the date in January. But um, hope you all have a nice Christmas and New Year. And yeah, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, thanks, Karen. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.